There we go. There we go. You know what I'm what I'm what I'm realizing. You guys are a bunch of rebels. You, you, just coming out in this stuff today. My my little car doesn't go through the snow quite so uh, so well. But have you ever noticed if you grew up in Iowa or lived in Iowa for a, a period of time, how like the beginning of winter, it's kind of like. Uh, you don't really want to get out and drive in the stuff. And eventually there, there comes this time where there's like, you cross a bridge and you go, you go, now it's just purely the challenge. Anybody else have that? Anybody else? Matt's laughing because he, he gets where I'm coming from. Let's say it again. It's a guy thing. All right, can we have Tim the tool man ready, ready? Good job, all right. Good job, yes. Yeah, so it's, it's the challenge, it's the fun of it. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you know, it's been so much fun uh, watching what God continues to do in and through uh, this church called Timberline. And uh, have you noticed week after week after week, uh, there's been new opportunities. We're sharing about new ministries, ways that you can get connected, ways that you can serve, ways that God is placing on different people's hearts, like, uh, like Brad and Crystal. Uh, the, the way to build our marriages is to offer a children's uh, a date night, you know, a night where the kids can be just dropped off here and we parents can get out and have a, have a date night. And somebody asked me, does, does a Target run or Costco run or Sam's Club or Walmart count or hy V? And I'm like, uh, no. So, so it's the idea. The idea is to get out and have some fun together as a married couple. And so I'm excited about that. That's just one of the many ministries that, that God is doing here through his people. This morning, before we dive into the sermon, or before we get into the message this morning, I want to invite Lynn Huxima uh, up to, to share with us. Lynn has a ministry that she has begun working on. She, I would say this, that I don't suppose a year or two ago, she, well, a little over a year ago, that she would even see herself doing this ministry. Come on over, Lynn. And, uh, and so uh, I, I've... I want Lynn to share kind of the vision behind this ministry, and I, I have found that I think if God could really, really use this ministry because this is something that I don't know if any of us have really been able to wrestle with. We've probably all gone through some level of grief or grieving, but, but how do we handle this? What do we do with that, and can we learn from somebody who has gone and is going through th this kind of pain? So I just asked Lynn if she would share a few minutes about this ministry, this grieving ministry. You don't grieve sharing it, right? I'm going to try not to, okay. <laughs> but thanks so a lot for that. <laughs> share with us, Lynn. What, what is God, what okay. is he doing? What's, what, what? All right, thank you, Gary. Um, well, good morning. This is the second time I've been up here to talk about a presentation. And for those that you don't know, the ministry that God led me to, I've entitled, Be a Blessing to Your Grieving Friend. And so I think that's pretty self-explanatory. But I do take a look at what does the Bible say about being compassionate, how does God equip us for that, and then a whole lot of practical advice because we don't know what to do with that. I found lots of people didn't know what to do with me. And so I thought, well, let me teach them <laughs> what to do. Um, so a lot has changed since last July when I gave the presentation here. And part of that is an online course that I've been taking about public speaking. And they say the number one thing that you need is to have a demo video on your website. Well, I have a website, I've done some presentations, but I have no video footage. So rather than just speaking to an empty room, I've decided to have my own party, essentially. And so I'm inviting people to come and to listen to my presentation while the magic happens back there with all the videotaping. So that will happen on February, Saturday, February 23rd at 1.30 here in the Worship Center. And the presentation is about 45 minutes. There's some time for Q&A. And if you've learned anything, there might even be a chance for you to be doing a little short video endorsement that might make it to the website, because all of this is going to go down to three or four minutes. Um, so if you've heard me speak before, I can tell you this is not the same thing. It's a little different focus, some of the same advice, but a different focus. Uh, and of course, while I would like people to come to fill up the audience, I really do think that there are things that you can learn from this. Because if you ever feel like you don't know what to say to someone, you're afraid you're going to make them cry, you're going to say the wrong thing, you disappear, disappear completely, then this is for you. Because I teach you how to handle all that awkwardness. So if you know that you're coming, um, if you can let me know, that's always helpful for the RSVP. But do come either way, and feel free to invite anybody that you think would benefit from it. Or might be looking for a speaker. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks, Gary. Excellent. Thank you, Lynn. Let's... 
Actually, that's a paragraph I missed. And again, it's February 23rd, a Saturday at 1.30. Right here. Right here. Okay. Thanks, Ryan. You're a so great they, straight man. So they can be, they can RSVP or they can just show up? They can just show up. Yeah. If they know they're coming, it helps me with maybe some food. Yeah. That'd be good. But other than that, just come either way. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. I'm excited. It's been fun. To, it's been amazing to see what God has done and continues to do through Lynn and this, this uh, grief ministry. And, and I will just reiterate some of the words she said there. If you don't know, if you've never learned what to say, have you ever felt that, by show of hands, have you ever felt awkward? about when you go to a, a, you know, a, a funeral or what, you're like, I don't know what to say. You know, and, and so something just comes out. <laughs> Oftentimes, those things don't necessarily lift up. And our intent is to what? L- love the other person and, and share our sorrow with that other person. But, but sometimes we just don't know what to say or how to say it. That is some of the things I've been able to listen to Lynn and, and, and learn from her. And we've done some of the same re- books of reading uh, uh, it's been just uh, very insightful. So I think that uh, that presentation will be great to support Lynn, support her ministry, and to learn. And, you know, it's 45 minutes to an hour out of our, out of our week, uh, well worth the time spent. So, Father, good morning. <laughs> Lord, we, uh, <clears throat> we come this morning. Lord, we know there are those in our midst that, that are grieving as part of our body today, even now. Uh, Lord, the loss of loved ones this week. We pray, Lord, that you would comfort them as we, as we consider uh, who they are. And Father, we know there are those that are in the hospital as part of our body right now. We think of Pat Drolick, and we pray for complete and entire healing for her as, uh, as she uh, is going to be hospitalized this next week. Uh, Father, uh, we pray for those who are sick and at home, couldn't be with us, might be tuning in online. We pray, Lord, that you would heal them as well. And Father, we pray for us today, Lord, as we gather in this place, we've, uh, we've, we've enjoyed the challenge of driving here, Lord, we want to be challenged by your word today. And as, as we think about, Lord, this, those, Lord, that we are all people that are undeserving of your grace. We are undeserving of eternal life. But Lord, you gave your son, Jesus Christ, you gave him away that we might experience eternal life by faith in no other name but his. And Father, for that we worship you, we celebrate you, we open up your scripture knowing that you spoke this through human hands by the power of your Holy Spirit. And so Father, you've given that to us, Lord, that we might be transformed. So Lord, I pray as we gather here, Lord, you'd open our hearts and our minds once again today. Lord, to hear your truth and to be changed by your truth. I, I pray, Lord, that, that it's not my voice they hear as we gather, Lord, but it's your voice. So, Father, speak, we ask, by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, my friends, uh, I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I shared a text uh, with our elders this week. I was doing some of my reading, and I'll, I'll share it briefly with you, and I want you to understand how vitally important I believe uh, this hour every week or hour and a half every week is to our lives. In, in one of my readings this week, I, I, I read, and I, I sent this out to the elders, it says this, we are in an age of visual literacy. The average adult who spends 50 hours a year in a pew or in like a seat you're sitting in will also spend about 2,000 hours at home watching television. Some estimate that most children, get this parents, you ready for this? Some estimate that most children between the ages of zero to five will spend more time watching television before entering school, before entering kindergarten, than listening to their father's voice during their entire lifetime. Does that bother anybody? Right? I, uh, I took that statistic, I took the, that information, and I broke it down even more so to our culture today, and I said, I sent this text out a little bit later, I said, let's think of it this way, if we spend the average, if the average Christian spends one hour to one and a half hours total length in church each week, and of that time, about 45 minutes is a sermon, uh, so they're hearing the word proclaimed, if they're hearing it proclaimed, 
truthfully and honestly with integrity. And if the average Christian only makes three out of four Sundays, we are looking at people who are gathered together for worship somewhere between 36 to 40 weeks out of a year. That, and, and you take that times 45 minutes worth of preaching, that means that lands us around the average Christian only sitting under the word of God about 16 to 18 hours a year. My friends, I share that with you to go, this is a very important time for us to be edified by God's word. But I also want us to understand that you cannot live only on this 45 minutes or this hour and a half in length every week. We want you, I want you to become what I call self-feeders in the word of God. I mean, you see in your programs, we have a scripture reading that we all can read together through the Read Scripture app, or you can just follow along in the programs each week. Learn to feed on God's word. Why? Because, my friends, we are bombarded by the world and the world's beliefs, and that mo- much of which are very contrary to God's scripture. Have you noticed? We need this time together. So I hope that you will continue to value our Sunday morning gatherings and study the word and become feeders of the word for yourselves and in small groups. And, and whenever we are together, we need this time. And, I, uh, and so... So I just want to be faithful with that and challenge you and encourage you with that. That being said, let me dive in this morning. I, uh, uh, many of you are on Facebook, on social media. I know I'm friends with many of you on, on my Facebook account. And some of you have even replied that you saw this week on my Facebook account uh, that we're having an auction. And uh, don't worry, this is not a shameless plug. I don't care if you buy my parents' stuff. Uh, but I will tell you that uh, mom and dad, my mom and dad, mom's in the nursing home, and uh, dad, they had downsized to a smaller town uh, in my hometown, and a, n- a number of their really nice things were left out in the farmhouse, and through conversation with dad, he finally agreed, time to move that stuff along, so we're having an auction, uh, and it's happening online, and it finishes tomorrow, and, and I look forward to that phase being done. It's been a hard time, it's been a difficult time, um, but it's been really, I think, ultimately good. Uh, good for dad. It's, it's what we do when we get older, isn't it? I mean, maybe you've had parents that are going, have gone through that or are going through that, or maybe you're walking them through it. It's part of getting older that we prepare for not being here on this earth. We prepare our things, get everything situated so that we could finish well. We can move on from this life until the next. And that's really what I see going on with this auction. And I, and I bring that to us today because this is much of what we see in our text for today. We see an older gentleman, and he's the ripe young age of 147 years. Can you imagine living 147 years? No. Who wants to live 147 years? Yeah, no hands, right? We got a dude named Jacob who has lived 147 years, and what we see, he's getting his stuff in order. We're going to see today that, that he's preparing for his death. In fact, he is, is affirming and securing his burial plot. He knows where he's supposed to be. God told him where he's supposed to be, but he's making sure that his son knows this for sure. And not only that, he is getting everything in order in regards to his, his inheritance. Who is going to be the first in line to receive his inheritance? We're going to see that. But I thought uh, as, we, as, as we're coming down, next week is our last week in the book of Genesis, I thought it would be good for us to look briefly, before we look into Genesis 48, look briefly at this man named Jacob. Why? Because almost half of the book of Genesis has been dedicated to some level to this man. We were first introduced to Jacob back in Genesis chapter 25. And you might remember the story, and I'm just going to walk through these really briefly here. He was, mar- uh, he was, sorry, he was born to Isaac and Rebekah. And from the very beginning of Jacob's life, all the way we'll see to today, there's something I'm going to propose to you that is very unique about Jacob. And it's the use of his hands. The use of Jacob's hands hands. Almost every significant event recorded around Jacob included some form of him using his hands in his life. Let me give you some of these examples. Uh, Starting in Genesis chapter 25, 26, when Jacob, who was uh, a twin, he has a twin brother named Esau, you might remember the story. 
when, well, first of all, remember Genesis 25 when, when his mama was pregnant? Do you remember what happened in the womb with those twins? I mean, we have one gal we know that's, uh, that's pregnant with twins. Here, she's not here. She must be serving in Quest Kids. She's out there, isn't she? Uh, can you imagine if your wife was, had those kids kind of beating each other up in the womb? Your wife might feel like that already, actually, right? Uh, right? But can you imagine how miserable she must have been? She must have been, Rebecca must have been, to have those kids fighting in the womb. And then when it came time to give birth, she must have thought, oh, this is going to be great. Get them out of here. You know, and here's what happens. The, the oldest, named Esau, heads out first. He's a hairy kind of dude, red hair, kind of covered in red hair, top to bottom. And out behind him comes his brother, Jacob. And what do we remember from Jacob? Yeah, he had a hold of the heel of his brother, Esau. They were going to be in conflict in their lives, and, they, and he held up to that. And Jacob actually got the name Jacob because it means heel grabber. We can really see the very character of Jacob based on how he uses his hands. It's, it shows his sin nature from beginning to end. In fact, what we could say is Jacob was a man of manipulation, a man of, uh, who liked to have control of things, and a man who would learn to take what was not his before it was his time, and he did it using his hands. In fact, we see even more in Genesis chapter 25 when Jacob and Esau had grown up. Esau was a great hunter. Jacob was good around the tents, around home. And uh, you might remember the story when Esau came in, been, he was famished, and he came in and he told Jacob, he said, give me some of that red stew. And do you remember what Jacob's like? Jacob says to his, his older brother, he says, give me your birthright, buddy. Paraphrasing there a little bit. Give me your birthright. And, and Esau's like, well, if I'm dead, what good is it to me to have a birthright? If I'm going to be a dead man, have my birthright. I don't care. Despised his birthright. Gave it to Jacob. And then Jacob took his hands and gave him some of his stew. Jacob loved to grasp things that were not his own. You think of Genesis 27. You might remember the story. It's when, when, uh, when their father Isaac had, was of old age and he was blind. And when Isaac was just about to pass away, he told his, bro his son Esau, the scriptures tell us that, that, Jacob, excuse me, that es Isaac loved Esau. And Isaac sent Esau out to make him a meal, to go hunt his game and bring it back because, because Isaac wanted to give his oldest son the blessing. Well, if you remember the story, you remember that Isaac's wife, who loved Jacob, overheard what Isaac said to Esau and said, oh, let's concoct a plan. And that's what, exactly what they did. With the help of his own mother, they dressed up uh, Jacob into, in some fur, some hairy garments and whatnot, all the way to cover up his hands with fur. And they presented, Jacob walked in there pretending to be his brother Esau, covered with all this fur. And you remember J uh, Isaac said, well, you sound like Jacob, but you feel like Esau. And what happened was Jacob connived his own a blessing from his father, pretending to be his older brother. He used his hands to do that. Yet, of course, what happened from there, that kind of made Esau a little bit upset, we might say. And in Genesis 28, we get to see where Jacob's fleeing for his life. And when, he, when he's fleeing, heading, getting away from his brother for his life, to say, preserve his life, he comes to this place called Bethel or Luz. And when he gets there, he falls asleep. He makes, a, with his hands, he makes a pillow out of a stone. And God appears to him at that time. And, so, and makes a, an incredible promise to him, a covenant promise to him, that no matter where Jacob goes, God promised to be with him. And that he will bring him one day back to the promised land. And remember what Jacob did with that pillow of stone? He turned it upright and he made it a pillar, a form of worship to God in that place. You know, for all the deceptive ways and things that Jacob did throughout his life with his hands, it's amazing to see God's grace to this man. His undeserved favor, this grace, God's grace, ultimately would change Jacob's life and his eternal destiny. I think this morning, if we, if we had time this morning and we opened up the microphone and we said, just think for a moment about your life. In fact, just think about your life this last week. Where have you seen God's grace at work? Good to think about those things, isn't it, from time to time? 
I know this week I, 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 was, I was front row to seeing God's grace upon a, a couple of different people's lives besides just my own. Uh, there, Sunday night, uh, uh, my daughter was working a shift, and I just love that she's on mission. She saw somebody in need, and she called me, and she asked me, Dad, would you come, come to work and, and help this person in need? And this person needed help, and I could see God's grace all over them in the, in the difficulties they were going through. And, and it was amazing to see, and it's been an amazing journey this week to, to be able to come alongside them and to help them and see the body of Christ, help them continue to see God's grace in their lives and in their life. And, 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 and while, in fact, while I was visiting with that person, uh, my phone went off. Uh, you'll love this. Uh, oh, Maybe. While I was visiting with them, my, my, my phone goes off. My neighbor tries to call me. And, and I text, texted him back, said, hey, call my wife, I'm busy. And, and my wife uh, texts me at that immediate moment. And, she, and I, I texted her and I said, hey, he's gonna call you. She texted me right back. She said, hey, honey, there's a body in our front yard. Right? That's what I did. I sounded something like that. And I go, I texted back, I go, a human body? <laughs> I'm thinking of animal, you know, whatever, right? She's like, Yes, and I'm like, uh, let me make this phone call. I called my wife. She goes, yeah, there's, there's, there's a body out in our front yard. And I go, I, I said to this person, I said, you stay here. Um, they're open 24 hours. I'll be back. And I drove home as fast as I could with all the four cop cars, two ambulances. It was a great time in the neighborhood. Here's this man who uh, celebrated the big game just a wee bit too much and ended up in our front yard, if you understand what I mean. Just whoop, right. So by God's grace, by God's, that man could have frozen to death that night. By God's grace, somebody driving by saw him laying there. Man, I got to see God's grace at work. How have you seen God's grace? Oh, by the way, he, he came to, and then he got an ambulance right free of charge. Um, God's grace. How have you seen it at work this week in your own life? Yeah, I never did hear the results for those who are wondering, what did I, <laughs> what did I find out about that? Well, then we come to Genesis 32, looking at Jacob. We see Jacob when he's all alone. He's afraid of his brother's wrath, and he sent his family ahead of him. You might remember the story Jacob wrestled, it says, wrestled with God that night. Look at how Jacob, again, used his hands. And he didn't want to let go. He's like, I'm not going to let go. The morning's breaking, but I'm not going to let go until you bless me. Jacob used his hands once again. You know, that angelic messenger had all the power in the heaven to d just simply destroy Jacob right at that moment, but instead, all he did was touch his hip, and Jacob had a limp for the rest of his life. But what also happened in that story right there was that that angelic messenger changed Jacob's name. It was the beginning of a change for this man who was known as Jacob as the heel grabber, and now he was getting the name Israel and that moved from his hands being something of grabbing to hands that could be a, something of blessing. What a, Again, what a picture of God's grace upon this man. Now, one of the ways that Jacob became, became a, a blessing was to his favorite son, Joseph. He made this coat of many colors, and he blessed him with it. But with those very same hands, you may remember the story when the sons turned him over and wanted to get rid of him. They dipped it in blood, covered it in blood, brought it to their father, and with those very same hands, here's Jacob holding this bloodied coat, believing that Joseph had been destroyed by an animal. Oh, these hands of Jacob over his life. They grasped his brother in conflict. He, the, he took his brother's birthright. He cheated his father's blessing. He made a pillar to God, a coat of blessing. And now as we come to our text this morning, we get to see his hands just one more time. And it's where we see his hands by faith, elevating the undeserving. Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 47. We'll spend a few moments here in, in, our, in the word today. And Jacob lived, Genesis 47, 28. Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the days of Jacob, the years of his life were 147. And when the time drew near uh, that Israel must die, he called his son, Joseph, and said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, put your hand under my thigh and promise to deal kindly and truly with me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but let me lie with my fathers. Carry me out of Egypt and bury me in their burying place. He answered, I will do as you have said. And he said, swear to me. And he swore to him. Then Israel bowed himself upon the head 
of his bed. Now, I think what we see there is by faith, one does not lose sight of God's promises. Here, as Jacob senses his days are going away, his day of, of, of passing away from this life to the next, he wanted to make sure where his bones would be buried. And so he wanted his son, Joseph, to come. And I mean, Joseph is now like the VP of Egypt. He's the second in command as overseer of Egypt. And Joseph wanted to, uh, he wanted, he, Jacob wanted Joseph to know where to bury his bones. In fact, at this point, it's really interesting. If you look back at Genesis 47, 27, the very verse before this, it says, Thus Israel settled in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they gained possessions in it and were fruitful and multiplied greatly. What we see here is that Jacob had been blessed by his son Joseph, second in command. So much so he had the best of the land in all of Egypt. And not only that, they had gained possessions from this and, and Jacob's family continued to be fruitful and multiply. And so Jacob called his very important son and said, I want you to swear. I want you to swear an oath to me. Now, in their day, it was commonplace. It's not something weird here, but it was very commonplace. If you were coming into an agreement with somebody else, swearing upon an oath with somebody else, you would invite them to take their hand amongst your inner thigh and, and make that promise while you grabbed their inner thigh. Now, we don't obviously do that today. It'd be kind of weird if Ryan and I were going to make an oath with each other. You, you up for it? No, okay. <laughs> right? It's kind of weird for us today. Um, it, we might kind of align this with something like, do you remember when we were kids? Did you ever do like the pinky swear thing, right? Right? You never break a pinky swear, right? Right? Anybody ever break a pinky swear? Shame on you. Oh, well, your Jacobness is coming out. Okay, <laughs> right? The heart of a pinky swear, you never break that. Or today we might say it's kind of like shaking hands in an agreement. When you swear that you're going to do something, you do it and you shake hands firmly with one another and say, I, upon my, I will do this or death you know, be upon me for breaking it. That's very much what we see here with Jacob and his very influential son, Joseph. What we see is that Jacob, by faith, had not lost sight of God's promises to him. He had been promised by God that one day he would return back to the promised land. And so Jacob wanted to get his things into place before he passed away to make certain that his son would follow through upon his death. Now, for the original readers, when they would have read this, this must have been an incredibly encouraging thing to know that God's promise of seeing the promised land would come true. For those of us today who have faith in Jesus Christ, no matter the difficulties we go through, no matter the times that we goof up, and, and I feel like I'm the king of goofing up in, in these things, no matter the persecution we go through that we face because of our faith, I want us to remember that we must keep focused on the promises that are before us, that there will be a day beyond this day that he's going to call us home because of our faith in Jesus Christ. We have a promised land waiting for us. Does anybody else get excited about that? Yeah. Anybody else really ready for it to hurry up and get here? That was not that enthusiastic. Okay, well, you got more journeying to do. Now we come to chapter 48, verses 1 through, two, 1 through 7. And I think it, it helps us to understand that the most undeserving can be adopted or are adopted. We see here in the verse, uh, first two verses, after this, Joseph was told. So there's a little bit of a break between 47 and chapter 48. After this, Joseph was told, Behold, your father is ill. So he took him, uh, excuse me, he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And it was told to Jacob, your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. Now, I don't want us to miss those first two verses. 
it's easy to read right through that and not realize what's going on. There's a, another man of faith here by the name of Joseph that is doing something amazing. See, what Joseph is doing here when he recognized, he heard that his father was getting close uh, to death, what Joseph did was he came by faith with his two sons. In other words, Joseph came with great humility. He's the second in command in Egypt, and what Joseph is doing is he's coming in this great humility, and he is desiring uh, for his sons to be identified with God's people. He wanted his two oldest sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, actually it's Manasseh and Ephraim, whoever's listed first in the scripture is the one of more priority, so uh, first rank, so it's Manasseh and Ephraim. That's how Joseph came. He came with those two sons alongside of him. For Joseph to do this, to desire for his sons to be adopted into his, his family line was a total act of faith. You see, for an Egyptian, of which they would be half Egyptian, to be adopted by shepherds was one of the most lowly things to actually pursue. The Egyptians would have been totally appalled by this. Kent uh, Hughes writes this. He says, Such identif identification with the shepherd clan would ultimately shut them off to any type of Egyptian prominence. Joseph's presence with his sons was a by-faith exercise in downward mobility. So here we have Joseph and Manasseh and Ephraim. They're standing before Jacob. And what we see in verses 3 and beyond, we see Jacob retelling the promise. He said in verse 3, God the Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan, and he blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply, and I will make you a company of peoples and will give this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. What Jacob is sharing with his sons is the very promise that was given to Jacob's granddaddy, Abraham, and to Jacob's daddy, Isaac, and had been given to Jacob himself. In fact, part of this blessing you might recognize from the Garden of Eden, what God said to Adam and Eve originally was, be fruitful and multiply. You know what's really interesting? That whole thing about be fruitful and multiply, that has actually been passed forward to us who are in Christ, who are by faith in Jesus Christ. You know, you know what Jesus said just before he ascended to be back with the Father after he had finished his work here on earth? He said, go and make disciples. Baptize them and then teach them to obey everything I have commanded. Let me say it this way. What Jesus told his disciples, and ultimately it has been passed down to you and I, is that true followers of Jesus Christ are multipliers. It's not an option. This is what we do. We are commanded to go and make disciples. Multiply yourselves. That's what we should do. So in other words, this year, let's think about 2019. What should happen is not, a, not an option. It, what we should be doing right in our neighborhoods is making disciples and inviting them to be part of the church family that we are a part of. In other words, what should happen if God were to be gracious to us and, and, and bless the, the work of our hands, the fruit of our hands, what should happen is a year from now, every one of us should have multiplied ourselves and this place will have to put more chairs out. My friends, that is what we are to do. And, and this is ultimately what Jacob is saying, look, God's promises are real. He has promised to do this, and he is reiterating this for his sons, uh, excuse me, for his son and his grandsons, that God is going to be faithful to be fruitful and multiply and bring him back to the promised land. So as Jacob reflects on all of this, I think in the middle of that he's reminded that he has an inheritance to give away. It is his. He's the rightful owner of it. And now he can give it away. And what we see in verses 5 through 7 in our text, he looks, he, he says this, And now your, your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine as Reuben and Simeon are. Did you catch that? 
I don't know so much that Joseph even caught it, but in verse 5 there we see where, where Ephraim, the younger, is actually listed first. So what Jacob is telling Joseph right there is, I'm going to flip things around. I'm kind of on God's time and God's ways. God does things differently than what man would do. He takes and he says, Joseph, catch the clue, buddy. Ephraim, the younger one, is going to be the greater, and Manasseh is going to be the lesser. And then did you see what he did with Reuben and Simeon? He displaced, number one and two, his own heirs, and he moved them down line. First Chronicles actually tells us why he did this. First Chronicles 5, 1 through 2 says this, uh, The sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, speaking about Reuben, he was the firstborn, but because he defiled his father's couch, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph. Man, Jacob. He had come a long way from being a heel grabber that he once was to become a man of faith. A man who realized the blessing that had been given to him by faith and he was now giving it to others who were really ultimately equally undeserving but he had the right to give away his inheritance to those he saw that would be fit. And then we see in verses 8 through 16, the undeserving get elevated at this time. Many of the scholars that I read say that um, verses 8 through, through 13 or 14 is actually more like a legal interaction uh, with an adoption process. This is legal language and legal action that they were taking. And look at verse, verse 8. Uh, the scholars say that uh, in that day, this was the common thing to do, they would ask, who are these? And then they, ultimately what they would declare is, here are these sons. Now, it, that's a bit different maybe than what we do today. If you've ever gone through an adoption process or you know those that have, uh, it may look a little bit differently, but ultimately these children are being declared, presented to those who are adopting them. Uh, I couldn't resist, but I want you to take a look at this short video here of, of an adoption that happened just a year or so ago. You think they all agree that this adoption ought to go forward? Yeah, they all love them. <laughs> <laughs> they all love them? Yeah, we all love them. Like, our whole family is like the best thing we've ever had. Oh, boy. That's great. <laughs> I'm glad to have these people. <laughs> That's really good to hear. <laughs> commitments that people make when they adopt? Yeah, I'm glad to be there. Um, so they're just really the best thing I ever had. Oh, I, just, so I can't wish, if I wish anything world, I just wish that, like, I could just love these people for, like, the rest of my life. If I had any doubts, there. <laughs> Sean, I'm going to ask you first if you'll approve the adoption. I'd officially <laughs> say yes. Do you approve? All right, would you show us? As you can tell, the adoption process uh, was a little different Jacob's day compared to maybe our day. But I think we could tell the heart of it is very much uh, very much the same thing. Look at the adoption process here as we see it in verse, uh, in verse 10. It says, Now the eyes of Israel were dim with age, so he could not see them. So here's what Joseph did. He brought them near to Jacob, and he kissed them, and he embraced them. That was Jacob taking each one of them and marking them as his own, giving them a kiss and hugging them and inviting them in. And then it says, And Israel said to Joseph, I never expected to see your face and beyond God, and behold, God has let me uh, see your offspring also. And then here's what Joseph did in reply. He removed the sons from his knees. And here Joseph bowed with his face directly to the ground as a form of submission. The second in command of Egypt was now bowing to this leader, his father, the shepherd. 
And not only that, as he removed him from his knees and he bowed with his face to the earth, what Joseph did next was the official presentation. He, he took with his, with his right hand, he took Ephraim and he handed him to his, to his father, figuring that that would be lined up with Jacob's left hand. And then he took Manasseh, the older son, and he presented him with his left hand so that, so that Jacob could bless him with his right hand because whoever got the right hand of blessing was obviously the first in the inheritance. And then we see Jacob using his hands one more time. And this time it was so different than earlier in his life. This time it was to elevate the undeserving sons. Jacob, also you know, of course known as Israel, placed his right hand on the younger Ephraim and his left hand on Manasseh, the firstborn, thus raising Ephraim to the firstborn status under Israel. Alan Ross says this, Joseph and many others like him expected God to work in a certain way, but found that he chose to work in a different and unconventional way. It had taken Jacob a lifetime of discipline to learn this truth about God. And then we see Israel blessed Joseph. There's a threefold blessing we see in verses 15 through 16. First, it says, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless these boys. Did you catch the threefold blessing? That God, that the God that walks with his people, do you know that God is still doing that for us today? The God who redeems his people. Do you know that God is still doing that for us today? And the God who shepherds his people. And he's still shepherding us today. Now for the original readers who would have heard this, probably just uh, after the Exodus and before they entered into the promised land, they must have been so comforted that God has and would always be walking with them, would be shepherding them, and would redeem his people even, even in spite of the times that they goofed up in following him well. My friends, the same is true for us today. It's all by faith in Jesus. And I think what we need to remember, I, I looked in that verse 15 when it talked about God who has been my shepherd all of my life. I couldn't help but reflect upon John chapter 10, verses nine through 11. It says this, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. My friends, that's the gospel. Jesus Christ, the good shepherd, came and gave his life as a perfect sacrifice, the one and only true sacrifice, and took all of our sins upon his body on the cross and poured out his covenant blood that poured out for our redemption. And then he was placed in that tomb. And on the third day, he rose again. And the great news to that is that just like he rose again, the same is true for us. For those of us that have faith in Jesus Christ, we too will rise again. We too will come into the presence of God. We too will walk into a promised land that is prepared for us to come into one day. And this good shepherd of ours, he did that. He laid down his life for us. The most undeserving of people, you and me. In fact, I, I gotta share with you, I couldn't help but go to Revelation 7, 17. This talks about what's ahead. You ready? For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd and he will guide them to springs of living water and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. My friends, that is our shepherd, Jesus Christ. And then we come to verses 17 through 20, and I think what we could simply say is here we see that the lesser will be greater, and I think we could say that we see Joseph was shocked. I mean, he had the hint back in verse 5, but verses 17 through 20 was when Joseph looked and said, but Father, you can't be crossing your hands. I put the right ones in front of you. You should have kept your hands just this way. I mean, this had to have been incredibly humbling for Joseph, the second most powerful in Egypt. He didn't see it coming. And I think we can see in verses 17 through 20 that Joseph was a little bit frustrated or a little bit angry, but he was controlled in his frustration. 
But notice what Jacob did when he responded to Joseph. He said, he said look, I'm re- I, I, Joseph, I get it, I'm, but I'm refusing it. Look, the way it is is the way it's going to be. And he assured his son Joseph that both Manasseh and Ephraim would be great. He said Manasseh would be a great multitude of people and Ephraim would become a great multitude of nations. Every, it must have been hard for Joseph, I think, to receive this because what would be commonplace historically in that time was that the father would prepare the eldest son for the future inheritance and how to handle it and what to do with it. So everything that Joseph would have plowed into Manasseh the oldest just got discarded by his daddy at that very moment. And his number two son, he had not groomed, now became the inheritor. Kent Hughes says this, Jacob could not reserve, excuse me, Jacob could not reverse the blessing even if he wanted to, and he did not wish to, not to change a single word, because the blessing did not originate with him, but with God. He, Jacob, was only the messenger. His crossed hands were an act of profound faith. In fact, it was this act of faith that the Hebrew writer grabbed a hold of. If you've ever gone through chapter 11 of Hebrews, you'll see this great chapter. It's a fabulous chapter about the men of faith that have gone before us. And, and so you might wonder, is Jacob listed in Hebrews chapter 11? He is. And it's right here that, that the Hebrew author grabbed a hold of and said, it's at this point on Jacob's death bed that he finally got it right. He finally walked by faith. Does that give any of us hope right here? If you're here this morning and you haven't put Jesus Christ, allowed Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life, you know what? This is really good news. But let me help you. You have no guarantee. None of us have a guarantee that we have tomorrow, my friends. So if you sense that Spirit of God prompting in you to give your life to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, my friends, I'm gonna encourage you, do it today. Have that conversation with God. Surrender your life, your will, to a far better will. I'm not saying it's gonna be easy. In fact, it might be quite difficult. But I'm gonna tell you, it has eternal dividends, both starting now till the day and beyond the day you meet him. Here's what Hebrew 11, 21 says about Jacob. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. Jacob's act of faith was pure and entire worship before God. And notice that it took Jacob his entire life to get his hands to do what was right. And when he did, his blessing was a complete and entire act of worship of obedience to God. And then we come to the closing verses in Genesis 48. And I think it just shows us that there is a greater gift to come. And when we look at Joseph's faith for just a moment, because this is a gift that was directed from Jacob directly to his son Joseph. When we look at Joseph, we look at his faith. This, This once was a boy stripped of his coat and left for dead by his brothers. He had watched the sovereign hand of his God orchestrate some amazing stuff in his life. Oh, the man Joseph, handsome and powerful, his faith, I would say, would be remarkable He came before his father in incredible humility and faith in chapter uh, 48 of Genesis we see today. And he came to give away his two eldest sons. He was taking them away from what was available to them, the power and the prestige of an Egyptian life to become humble, despised shepherds. Now by faith, Jacob blessed his son Joseph for his faith. And what it says here, he gave him a mountaintop. And I was really confused around this final couple of verses. What in the world is he talking about? And there's a few different thought processes on here, but when you boil this down, this mountaintop that he's talking about is translated Shechem. Now Shechem is the very place, when we research it, that Jacob's bones the promised land where Jacob's bones were going to be buried. And so Jacob looked at his son Joseph and said, that's where I'm going to be buried. And that mountaintop, that promised land, 
was mine, and now it's yours, Joseph. In fact, if we trace that mountaintop, we will find that one day later on in Scripture, it is actually called the land of Ephraim. Joseph's son that was adopted away. My friends, as we close this, this, this passage and we get really close to closing Genesis next week, you know, I reflected on Genesis 48. It's an amazing story of an old man who learned to worship truly on his deathbed. And right there at that time, he took full charge to make sure that his future inheritance was properly in place. His deathbed was Jacob's singular true triumph with his hands. He did this all under God's grace by faith, and he worshiped by faith. So I'm going to give you three brief times away from us. Uh, I'm going to give you three brief take-homes. Uh, with every scripture text, remember, you can, it's either about knowing something, doing something, or being something. And I think uh, a heavy amount of this is about knowing what we ought to know from this text. Number one thing I think we ought to know is that inheritance into, the, into God's kingdom is by God's grace alone. Amen? Number two, it is God who calls the undeserving by faith in Jesus Christ. How many of us feel like we deserve eternal life and salvation? I didn't see a single hand. My friends, we are just like Jacob. Did you sense your Jacobness <laughs> as we looked at his life? We reflected on him? It's so beautiful because we all have hope. God calls those, the most undeserving, to be elevated. And it's by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And as I've spoken already, if that describes you and you haven't come to faith in Jesus, I invite you to do it today. If you don't know what that means, grab the person sitting next to you when we close here in a few moments. And number three, it is God alone who elevates us to become his adopted children. If you doubt that, Ah, I would just invite you, go memorize Romans chapter 8, verse 15. It says, ah, in faith we no longer have to be children of fear, but rather we are adopted sons of the one most high, sons and daughters of the one most high. We no longer have to fear because he's got us. Father, uh, Lord, I just thank you. It's by faith, Lord, that you elevate the undeserving Thank you for the story of Jacob and giving us his life and to see, you know, Lord, he, he goofed up most of his life, but Lord, he got it right to follow you and your commands and, and, and to do what you ask for him to do. And just that reminder, Lord, that you, <laughs> you do things way differently than we would do. And we give you praise for that and we thank you for our salvation. Lord, we love you. We praise your name in Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. Yeah, it's good to be washed by the word, isn't it? Uh, it struck me as, as Gary was talking and as he brought up the theme of adoption um, to recognize that, that through Christ, adoption is available to us. And I was just having a conversation with my mother-in-law last night who, who adopted uh, a young girl from Columbia, uh, who's my sister. And uh, it's been now, I think, five, at least five years since she was adopted. And... Um, we were talking about just um, the process of adoption and the idea that that um, rather rather than you know fooling a child into to believing maybe that they're your biological child when they're not, but the beauty the beauty of adoption is that um, you chose this child and saying saying I want you to be a part of my family. I want you to be my child. I want you to have what I have and I want you to be brought up in my home and I want you to be loved by us. And how beautiful that is. And recognizing that the courtroom of our adoption happened at Golgotha. And that the price that was paid so that God would adopt you into his family, so that you would belong, so that you would have what he has, so that you would have a relationship with him, so that you would belong to his family, so that you would be called his child, was paid by his son hanging on a tree for you. That by faith, 
you would call him Abba Father. As Gary likes to say, Daddy, Daddy. God chose you. God wants you today. And it's as simple as putting your faith in his son Jesus, as, as Gary shared. Man, that's a powerful message. And then there was one other thing that hit me when Gary said it. He said that we are multipliers. We're called to be fruitful and multiply, that now through Christ we're fulfilling the original command in the garden to be fruitful and multiply. And many of us have chosen to be dividers instead of multipliers. Is that what's holding us back? Because we're choosing to divide over menial issues rather than saying, look at what Christ has done to us, done for us. Let's go multiply. God's command to us is make my family bigger. Make my family bigger. I want to fill heaven with my creation. Bring them in. Show them what Christ has done for you. And invite them into that relationship. Make my family bigger. Amen? Sorry, I get worked up. <laughs> Great message, Gary. I'm going to close with Ephesians. Would you all stand? Close with a benediction from Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. And I'm going to paraphrase a part of this because um, it says the word saints, and I'm going to paraphrase it brothers and sisters because that's what we are, children of God, brothers and sisters together. May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all your brothers and sisters and with Jesus what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Our children are still being discipled for uh, the next foreseeable future. I'm not sure how long. Uh, so you guys enjoy some fellowship time together and we'll see you next week.